Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. I hope you got something to uh, refresh yourself. Water, coffee, chai. OK. All right, uh, let's continue uh, discussing what we were discussing. Um, some of the challenges that the youth are facing in the last session, we discussed um, both the challenges that the youth pastors are experiencing, youth ministers, youth leaders, and then we began to look at some of the challenges that the youth of this generation, of this day and age, are experiencing. We began with mental health and with loneliness and, and the number of choices that's available and with time. And, and some of uh, more, more challenges uh, that we all are aware of is, um, say, sexuality, uh, sexual purity in the society where pressure and temptation exists and um, identity, right? So sexuality, uh, we can just talk about that sexuality and identity or sexual identity uh, slash sexual purity, etc. Um, um, we are living in a day and age where media is uh, just teaching or in the culture is kind of portrayed where um, sex has no consequence and uh, it requires no commitment it uh, and sex before marriage is fine having multiple sexual partners is fine and starting at a very young age is absolutely fine um, because that's the idea it's been portrayed when i say media mainstream media i'm talking about um, every uh, every stream of media from movies um, etc uh, right um, movies are is one of the big things but yes it's not the only thing um, and talk about identity um, you know uh, again the loneliness is kind of birthed out of this place uh, saying self-worth is not there or insecurity um, you know everything is based on looks um, and um, so sexuality identity um, and um, absence of a father figure this point is more so in the north american continent um and uh, it might not be entirely accurate to uh the, you know or every other um demography but um but that but that is a very real point though okay absence of a father figure or a broken family that kind of uh, can be a uh, uh uh, it can be relatable in multiple uh, multicultural context um, negative media influence right to be worthwhile you must be beautiful um, and avoid pain and pursue pleasure at all costs you have one life go to whatever you want to do uh, right and um, yeah as I mentioned sex is a recreational pursuit there's no consequences and everybody does it so you know no big deal it's a recreational pursuit um, there is no consequences and because there's no consequences that leads to young people uh, advocating for a pro pro choice and that's the big debate now one of the big debates now is pro choice versus pro life isn't it and so because uh, they think that there there are no consequences or there there should be no consequences uh, in pursuit of recreational sex or casual sex or multiple sexual partners uh, they do, they they say it's my body, my choice, whatever, blah blah, right? Um, so that's another challenge there. And these are all very real challenges, right? And then violence and vengeance. Uh, money brings happiness. Um, you know this constant pursuit of just that. Um, dependence of technology, but like we've spoken already, right? So uh, these are all the challenges. Now. Challenges is a good starting place for us to know um, how we can, um, you know, approach and minister to young people. Because knowing the challenges alone is not enough. Let me be very clear. Okay, knowing we can know their challenges and continue to ignore them completely and continue to live our own lives, uh, or you know, continue to ignore their challenges completely and then just teach what you want to teach. I don't care what the young people are going through. I'm not going to address any of their uh, their challenges or their issues. I'm just going to teach what I think and feel is important. 
um, right? And so I'm talking about the posture of it. It's important that we, you know we teach, uh, you know, that you instill uh, what you feel is important. But then I'm talking about the posture of the heart and how you approach in ministering young people. Right, so knowing their challenge is not enough. It's a good starting place. It's a good starting point, uh, but then that's where the actual journey begins. Is that as ministers, we must, you know, prayerfully work on okay, what can we do now? How can I serve my young people well? Okay, um, so uh, the how how you're going to go about doing that is up to you. Um, I'm not going to say this is how you have to do it, but then nevertheless, I have mentioned a few topics that you can consider doing in your youth ministry. Okay, some of these are some of the topics that um, I have done uh, with the young people, uh, and we continue to do uh, as well. So, um, based on their challenges, some of them are, for example, identity. Um, there is a resource APC. A publication called who we are in Christ um, that you can use but there are a lot more resources online uh, foundations just the basic foundations uh, that talks about builds a foundation on prayer faith worship uh, etc um, no gossip I think is a, it's a good one <laughs> um, sexual purity um, these are some of the topics guys overcoming uh, and then just as an overcoming can be subdivided into so many subcategories or subtopics like overcoming depression, overcoming anxiety can be a topic for another Sunday, and overcoming fear, overcoming addictions, temptations, emotions that destroy, emotions that destroy like anger. That's what I mean by that, right? Um, and overcoming peer pressure, etc., intimacy with God, worship as a lifestyle, salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can begin to add in a little bit of. Um, doctrinal theological stuff as well because it's important that we equip our young people while we address the challenges that they are facing going through we also give them the tools and to make them their foundations stronger and that's why we talk about baptism of the holy spirit uh, basics of apologetics how can they defend their faith in the marketplaces in their colleges in their in their camp offices etc uh, love and relationships, fulfilling God's purposes. Um, and there's so much more, guys. I've just listed a, down a few things. Okay, um, this is just to give you an idea of uh, the topics that you can cover. Okay, so that is chapter five, and I hope that was uh, helpful. We are going to continue to. Uh, I, I want to like paint this as like one big chapter, even chapter six, like understanding youth culture, because now that we've understood their challenges, remember. Uh, understanding the challenges or knowing the challenges is just a starting place but we're going to go just a little deeper in chapter six is uh, you know we when we say this generation we've heard about the Millennials now Millennials can be generation X Y and Z are considered as Millennials more so with generation Y and generation Z uh, and now after Gen Z Gen Z you know um, after Gen Z we have generation Alpha uh, that's where we are at as a world as a society right that's where we're at gen alpha but let's take a moment to understand and try uh, different generations okay from the early 20th century okay so now uh, generations are typically defined in a 15-year brackets that's how they do it I've done it um, but let's take a look at it okay so the first generation we are going to look at are known as builders, okay, or traditionalists, or also known as the silent generation. Um, this generation of builders, they were born pre-1945, right, or the silent generation, where they sacrificed their needs of, and those for their families, right? These, this is the generation that went into fight in the Great War, who endured uh, the British rule um, in India, uh, you know, colonization and all of that. Um, in the North American continent, this is the generation that uh, endured Great Depression, uh, the Great Depression that happened in uh, in, the, in the late 20s, uh, 1920s, uh, and 
it, it was very bad, right? And they, this is a generation that witnessed World War II, uh, World War One, and World War Two. And so uh, they've given up a lot. They've sacrificed a lot, this generation, uh, right? Uh, and then the generation that comes after that are called as either boomers or popularly called as boomers, but they were known as the baby boomers. This generation were the children of the silent generation. So what this generation, everybody is born between 1946 and 1964. Now, um, they embraced consumerism. Now, we have to remember, now there was a little bit of a, little bit of a boom that was happening after the war and Great Depression and whatnot, right? Now, India is free, uh, British have gone back to their region, their country, uh, and so there's a growth economically as well, uh, politically and all of that. And so slowly, countries are beginning to do well. Economies are growing. And so the children of the silent generation embraced consumerism. Right? They began to pursue money and things and in excess when they were not satisfied. Okay, so that is the baby boomers or the booming generation. And then we have the generation X, all those who were born uh, between 1965 and 1979, and then Generation Y, where the millennials come in uh, between 1980 and 2001. That's the Gen Y. Uh, they've given them 20 years. Uh, but yeah, it's cooler. <laughs> and then we have the Generation Z, Gen Z, post millennials, that's uh, born post 2001, right? 2001 onwards. Now, um, why is this important for us to understand is that for the first time in history right for the first time in history we have some of them <clears throat> excuse me we have some of them from the silent generation who are still alive and then we have if not some or most of them from the boomers generation who are still alive and then we have a lot from generation x who are still alive and generation y who are still alive and then we have gen z for the first time in history we have five generations that is kind of coexisting in the society in the churches in the communities now why is that big because all of these five generations want to be heard. Are you with me? All of these five generations, they want to be heard. They want to express themselves. They want to be listened to, right? Uh, and <laughs> it, it, this is pretty big, guys. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's not a joke. Uh, it's it's a very serious thing to consider. And among all of this, among all these noises, we as youth ministers are trying to reach a certain group. You know, that could be Generation Y or Generation Z, Gen Y, Gen Z, Millennials. And so uh, we are going to intentionally kind of learn just a little bit more about Millennials because that they are the current existing young people, the youth of our generation, right? And um, Gen Y, Gen Z, and Gen Alpha. Uh, just to know how do they live, how did they get here, uh, what, you know, wh where will their paths take them, what does their faith look like, um, and all of that, right? Because um, I have mentioned the youth are changing, right? This generation, among the five generations, uh, they want to be heard. They want to. They want to voice their opinions, um, etc. Right? They are changing socially. They are changing intellectually because of the abundance of knowledge or information that is available. Right? Just 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I couldn't Google court charts. Right? Uh, if we had to, if if we have to learn song uh, lyrics for a, any song that we liked. Uh, CD player or cassettes, if any, any of you remember cassette tape recorders, rewind, 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 rewind until that film comes out of the cassette. <laughs> Put a pencil inside that and start rewinding it. That's how we rewind it, you know, if it is working. 
and listen closely to the song lyrics and with their accents and try to write their lyrics down and all of that and try to learn the song try to get the right chords and all of that uh, but uh, now you can just google the whole thing right uh, i'm i'm just saying that uh, you know intellectually because of the uh, availability of information and uh, how easily it is accessible ha is changing young people socially as well intellectually as well emotionally um, morally and spiritually they are changing right they're constantly looking for answers like okay who am i who are my friends where am i going what are going to be my life choices etc etc right because there are so much of outside influences that's shaping all their values what's causing them to change right? from, from their peers the colleagues um etc etc right and out of all of that some of the trends uh, that's uh, affecting the young people this day and age uh, some of the trends that are affecting is i've mentioned a few in the notes you see is secularization okay and and this is a very real trend what's happening is in secularization um you know religion and religious values associated with it disappear from the culture so there is no um accountability for anything related to morality right uh, and i'm talking i'm not necessarily only about christian i'm just talking about religion in general i'm talking about the secularization from its perspective what it is doing to the communities and societies right religion um, all the values associated with it is gone um, gender revolution i don't need to say more uh, <laughs> uh, it's becoming more fluid genders are fluid it's no longer just male and female they there are every day the numbers keep increasing on the number of genders that there can be from 40 odd to 70 odd genders and uh, binary which was binary which was male and female it's become non-binary um, right anybody can wake up one day and think and say that okay today i, I a man can i wake up and say okay today i identify as a five-year-old kid so i'm going to dress up like a five-year-old kid today i just uh, an adult man can wake up and say i feel like a woman so i'm going to identify myself as a woman and i expect everybody to identify me uh, address me as a woman uh, you know gender it's it's, it's a very it's a very scary trend secularization gender revolution privatization uh, and pluralization uh, and all of this i mean we can go through it i'm just going to go through them uh, you know you can look into it in more detail uh, technology revolution we are aware of what uh, where we are and um, the impact that technology uh, has had uh, you know not necessarily bad because we have to remember right uh, technology got us through covid Okay, uh, without technology, uh, you know, churches wouldn't have continued to meet during COVID. It helped us. So all of this is not to paint a picture uh, and say, okay, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. No, it's, it's just being misused or manipulated, I should say. Right? And all of this, all of the above is kind of linked uh, with hyper-individualism. It's all about me. You see the stark difference from silent generation pre-1945 that gave up their lives, that sacrificed everything uh, to, in this day and age, that it's all about me, how I feel, how I look. I will wear what I think is right. Why should I care about others' values, etc., etc. Hyper. It's not just individualism. It's hyper-individualism. And any points or remarks that's made against a certain individual, uh, you know, in this category is very easily offended. Right? And because of that, they're not going to come to church. They're not going to come to this youth meeting or whatnot. <laughs> uh, are you guys all with me? Yeah, are you following? Right? Uh, 
you know, there's a study that says by 2030, by 2030, 75 percent of the millennials will represent global workforce. It's a scary number. 75 percent of millennials around the world will represent global workforce. Uh, how many of them will represent your church? Right, in Judges chapter 2 verse 10, um, it says, in, after that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. We've read that scripture in the previous classes. Right, uh, we owe to the next generation an encounter with God. Among all of these noises of the world, uh, you know, what is the church doing? How can we actively engage the young people? Is the question that we all need to answer on a regular basis. Right? Uh, how can we use the very thing that is being um, that is impacting them negatively to have a positive impact? How can I use technology and social media to have a positive impact on that? Right? Because we need to realize that technology is the new Sunday. <laughs> right? uh, it's we learned that during COVID. So impacting millennials with good use of technology and social media and uh, relational leadership. Now, this is huge uh, because uh, the young people of this day and age no longer uh, recognize or acknowledge authoritarian leadership style. Okay, that, was, that worked in, in, in a certain day and age. Right, and so I've I've just meant to put uh, uh, an image uh, taken uh, from John Maxwell's uh, one of the books for, called the Five Levels of Leadership. If there are hundred books in the world on leadership, John Maxwell has written ninety of them. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, any topic on leadership, uh, I think he's just covered it. But uh, he writes something very interesting on on leadership on relational leadership uh, i'd like to i'd like to take us through it so first one at the very bottom we have positional based leadership um, people follow you because they have to right okay you're a leader okay they will follow you because you have the title called leader right they will if they have to salute you they will salute your rank and not the person so to speak right that's the positional leadership and then you have the permission uh, the second level is uh, people follow you because they want to you see that now there's a sudden shift okay they follow you because there's something about you uh, that draws them to you so they they will follow you because they want to Right. And the third level of leadership is production based. Results are seen. People now follow because of what you have done for the organization. So, as a leader, you have paid some price. There are sacrifices that you have made. And that they want to acknowledge that as like, hey, this person walks the walk and, you know, uh, uh, walks the talk, so to speak. Okay. They, they are sacrificing themselves for the betterment of the organization. That's the kind of person I want to follow. Right, that's the person who is uh, who is there first and leaves the building last. So people follow because of what you have done for the organization. And then there's the fourth level of people development, reproduction, is where people follow because of what you have done for them. So now it gets a little bit more personal. It's not just they follow you because, you know, for the organization, which is general, but now you are taking it up a notch by saying, okay, they want to follow you because You've done something for that individual personally. And then finally, this, the, the pinnacle, like the fifth level of leadership is people follow because of who you are and what you represent. 
So there comes a place in leadership where they will no longer follow you for what you have done for them or what you have done for the organization. But it comes a time in leadership that they will follow you simply because of the person that you are, for your character, for your values, for integrity, and what you represent. Right? And, and, uh, and I, I believe that you know this is the kind of uh, leadership that young people are looking for in this day and age is that they really don't care uh, you know how much you know until they know how much you care for them right and if you are still interested in this topic of leadership uh, uh, one of the books that's impacted me um, it's not a Christian book uh, it's it's called turn the ship around I've mentioned it in the notes I turn the ship around by David Marquet, um, who was a, who's now a retired captain of the U.S. Navy. It's it's a beautiful book um, that you have to read. And just one of the quotes there it says, uh, "Leadership should mean giving control rather than taking control, and creating leaders rather than forging followers." Um, you know. Uh, I agree with the first half of it for the most of it, uh, but then, then he goes on to say creating leaders. Then, rather than forging followers, uh, you know, it's important that we have followers as well. I, 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 I did a session on uh, fall, being a good follower in one of our mentoring classes, mentoring hours. Uh, but it is important that, uh, but a, a, a good leader or a leadership or, or a leader in training will always be a good follower. So that goes without saying, right? Um, but that's a good book. It's a good read. Uh, for, you know, I would recommend that uh, for you to, you know, um, get it if you can. OK, so how can we impact millennials or the young generation of this day and age? Good use of technology and social media, relational leadership, build a rapport with them, get to know them, spend time with them, go for a coffee with them. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, and remember the conversations that you have with them. For example, if my last conversation with, this is just an example, uh, like if my last conversation with, uh, say, John was on uh, the exam that he was about to write, um, you know, remember that the next time you meet him and say, okay, hey, how did that exam go? Or it could be anything. Okay, uh, the last conversation could be like, okay, I was going through something bad, uh, or a, or an interview, uh, etc. And the next, you know, don't forget to follow up and say, how did the interview go? How did the exam go? How are you feeling today, etc. All of that is relational leadership, which is very very important um, because in this day and age, young people will not, uh, you know, re uh, respond to authoritarian. They might, but. Uh, because they simply have to, right? And in addition, uh, have uh, a dynamic uh, youth events or youth programs um, for young people that will impact, uh, have a solid impact, uh, have a review meeting, uh, have ask questions like, okay, what was good about this youth meeting? What was bad about this good meet, uh, you know, about this youth meeting? What was missing in this youth meeting? Or was there any element of this youth meeting that was confusing to the young people? Uh, is it in the material or it, was it the topic? Or was it a communication? For example, it was not communicated. Where are we going to meet? When are we going to meet, etc.? Was there any confusion in you know the building up to the event, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? And so these were the four questions that I would you know I would kind of do with the core team. Okay, was there anything good about this? What went well? What were the wins? What went wrong? What did not work, etc.? Having a good review meeting with your team constantly will help you a plan for a more uh, dynamic events okay this is i'm talking only about events yes. right and 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 have a solid depth in spiritual leadership uh, et cetera, etc cetera. Uh, are you all with me so far any questions because i feel like i've been talking too much is, is it making sense Okay, thank you, services. 
Okay, um, this is coming down to uh, you know, the uh, 6.4 at the bottom of page 29. Um, how do young people commit to being part of com a, a community? Uh, consistency was a big, uh, you know, discussion, isn't it? Um, so how do we get young people committed to being part of a community? Right? How can how can there be some consistency? So uh, there are two things in building um, a people who are committed to a community is one is culture. Uh, culture is huge, right? Um, you want to set a culture. You want to see a culture um, for your ministry, whatever that may be. Because again, um, the culture that you are creating is the culture that you will allow. Okay, if you again, if you do not set the culture for your youth ministry, it will be set for you. If you are, if you as a leader are allowing a culture of gossip, that's the culture that is, that is being set because you as a leader are not confronting or addressing that. At the same time, on the other side of the coin, uh, if you know, if you are setting a culture of honor, that's what will be seen. Right, that and everybody who steps in will know. Okay, hey, in this youth um, ministry of so and so church, everybody is honored, and because that's the culture, right? Uh, and again, culture always it will be said the culture that you are creating is the culture that you allow as a leader. It flows from the top. Okay, um, so. Uh, this was some of the points that uh, I would share with the core team uh, and the young people as to the culture that we are going after as youth ministry at APC. So uh, what was the first thing is come as you are. Okay, uh, nobody is going to be, um, we have to make very clear that, okay, doesn't matter who's coming in, they are welcome as they are. It doesn't matter, you know, where they've been, what they've done, how many tattoos they have, how many piercings they've got. Their looks should not matter. What they've done should not matter. But they come as they are, but they don't leave uh, the same. They, you know, they encounter Jesus, right? And so, come as you are. Uh, there needs to be a culture of encouragement. Uh, no, no constant ridicule uh, or criticize. Uh, you know, um, uh, too much of uh, uh, criticizing that happens, uh, or insults that's thrown around. Or uh, Ephesians five, it says, right? Uh, you know, don't let loose talks. Uh, you know, be among you. Um, so, but instead of that, let there be a culture of encouragement. Okay, and then knowing the why. Why are we doing what we are doing? And so if you as a leader, one, know why you're doing what you're doing, and then if your core team knows why you are doing what, you know, uh, what they're doing, and then if the young people understands and sees the why, there is a culture of consistency that's being built. Okay, they will, they will submit to that. Okay, I see what they are doing. I see why they are doing what they are doing. And I, you know, I'm coming in agreement with that. I understand that. And so there's you know consistency that's being built, and and that leads to commitment eventually, All right? So first thing is culture. Um, we can dwell on talk about this uh, all day, but it's uh, but culture is important, guys. Okay, um, the culture that you uh, that is being set or being created is the culture that you allow, and so be careful as a leader, as a pastor, of what culture is being set in your ministry, uh, in your church, and secondly, uh, finally, is community. Right. Uh, what is the difference between uh, a community or or, or a, and a group of people? This is a question, by the way. What is the difference between a community and a just a random group of people?
Come on, guys. What is the difference between community and just a group? OK. Um, Jeffina says, I believe the community takes care of each other, while the group is just a group. OK. <laughs> There is union in community. There is union in community, yes. And what about the group? There is no union in. Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Abu, we can't hear you. Community, community comprises of group uh, different uh, comprises of groups of people with different ideology, different mentality, ethnicity, different ideas. Mm -hmm. But a group is a set of people that have the same idea, the same goals, the same focus, the same plan. So it's mm -hmm. clear. Okay, thank you. All right, yeah, I think uh, yeah, Subhashish uh, says something interesting. A community have a mission. They have an objective, a purpose um, as a team or as a group of people. While a group of people can, it could just be a get together. Like, okay, we are just meeting to, for a barbecue and uh, we're just going to have a nice time. There, not necessarily an objective. The only objective could be, okay, we're going to have <laughs> meet for barbecue. Um, but there is no a mission or a vision per se, right? Um, like my, Rosalind is saying, like-minded people build community and a group is only people who don't know why they have come. Uh, but I'm sure they know why they have come. They have come to have a good time or uh, whatnot. But I think what differentiates is that a community uh, has a vision. They have an objective. They have a purpose, like a very clear, and that's, that which, is, which lasts longer versus a group can uh, you know um, they'll be done after whatever the, you know they got together to do so that's the, the difference between a community and a group but what should a Christian community look like um, I've mentioned a few scriptures in your notes from Romans 12 to Matthew 18 uh, you know from where two or three are gathered together as my followers I am there among them Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25 says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good work. Let us not neglect our meeting together as, pe as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So you see that um, from the previous section, from the previous points, we looked at come as you are, encourage one another. Right, having a clear idea of the why, etc., is all kind of you know clearly laid out in Hebrews 10. Um, don't uh, let us not neglect our meeting together, right? Uh, but encourage one another, motivate one another uh, in acts of love and good works. In multiple scriptures in Proverbs 11, 15, and uh, 24, you see that where there is no counsel, the people fall, um, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So there is. It's saying that in Christian community should be like a multitude of counselors where people find safety, right? And so why is community is important is simply because we were created to be relational, right? We are, we are not designed to be alone. Yes, we are not designed to be alone. God said it is not good for man to be alone. So boom, community is birthed there, right? Uh, we are created to be relational. And secondly, uh, or finally, God loves people. We cannot, we as a church cannot say, I love Jesus and not love people. Right? God loves people. And so it's what we kind of look at, uh, you know, and we all know chap the love chapter from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 love is patient, love is kind, etc., etc. And uh, uh, if you have your notes with you, right? If you have your PDF with you, there's an image with the simple addition there. Do you all see that? Yes? 
Okay, so uh, tell me what you see. That's a test for you guys. Everybody's looking at the notes, right? Okay, guys, so there's a test over there on the PDF for you all. What do you see? Is Jeffina the only one who's looking at the PDF? It's not a tricky question. I'm sure it's not a difficult test. Okay, we are page 32. If that's Can I get the... Yes, sir. Sir. Hello? Yeah, yeah. yes. Okay, I'll, I'll even share the screen. Okay, there you go. Is this fine? Okay, so... So what do you see? Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, this is a simple test, right? So we, you know, this has been done so many times, uh, you know, and, and the answer that we get is what you would normally say is that okay, the third one is wrong, 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 uh, but. Uh, uh, you know, no one has ever said uh, there are three right answers. So the point is, uh, you know, except for JP now, um, <laughs> who remembers this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the point here is again, you know, it's very easy for us to find fault. It's very easy to that, that's that's it seems very natural for us to find mistakes, uh, but it takes uh, you know somehow the mistakes blinds us from seeing um, three right things in a person trying to draw a parallel, right? And so that's how a Christian community should be is like you know so full of love um, that we accept people, but at the same time we we equip them to build a better life, uh, like the life that. Jesus has commanded us to live, right? And um, and there are more points in scriptures uh, given about how we can be a Christ-centered community, right? Um, so, guys, that that's pretty much about it for youth ministry in general. Is that's the kind of conclusion is, um, and I want to leave us with just this one point: is uh, as a leader, as a pastor of a ministry um, if you're asking this question about how we can ignite passion among young people um, and the answer is very simple like they want to see how passionate you are for jesus uh, what are your choice of words when you describe him when you define jesus when you talk about jesus uh, what is the language what kind of words are you using to describe him and define him? how passionate are you and so if you want to see 
passionate young people in your church, it all begins with you. <clears throat> right? it, that, that's a simple answer to that question. How do we ignite passion <clears throat> among young people? It begins with you. Right? Um, are, you are you willing to set yourself on fire or be on fire for Jesus? And uh, because fire cannot be ignored and will not be ignored. And when young people see that, that you are authentic and that you are genuine, that you are genuinely burning with zeal and passion for Jesus, they will be filled with passion for him. OK, um, so I hope this course has been helpful. Uh, as I mentioned, this is just an introduction to youth ministry. Uh, we looked at who the young people are, to the organizational aspect of it, and some of the challenges that ministers and young people face this generation, and, um, and how we can impact them. OK, uh, any thoughts, um, anything that you want to share? Okay, if not, uh, today will be the last class. We will not have classes from the following week. Uh, please continue to work on your assignments and submit uh, them before the deadline uh, date. All right. Well, thank you all for joining. Uh, once again, I hope you've learned something from this course. Uh, God bless you. I'll see you around. Thank you.